G'day YouTube, Warbles on a lot here with uh, part 10 of the partial book reading in the series of One Crowded Hour, the biography of Neil Davis, the combat cameraman by Tim Bowden. This is the conclusion of chapter 13, Tet. Taking up where we left off, Davis's work diaries for the next three days are masterpieces of understatement. Huey, 24 February. Located Arvin, 1st Division, 2nd 3rd Battalion, and accompanied them to captured section of wall. Major Din, Battalion CO, raised Vietnamese flag from main citadel flagpole at 11 o'clock. PM, assault on palace with Arvin. Stayed till dark, only scattered opposition. Unable to return to Arvin HQ through city due heavy sniper fire. So crossed the south side over footbridge now in place, stayed south side, incomplete. The battle for Hue, 150 feet today. That's 150 feet of film, 120 feet to the minute. Hue, Sunday, 25 February. Returned north side early a.m., Filmed in devastated area in Citadel, also snipers, bracket NVA, who made last ditch stand last night. Then through entire palace grounds and filmed comprehensively. Returned Arvin headquarters early PM and filmed NVA POWs just brought in. Then to Southside, walked to outskirts of city to get private car to drive me to Phu Bai. There by 15.30, get Marine H46, CH46 to East Da Nang, Taxi to press centre, arrive there 17.30, stay overnight. Complete the battle for Hue, 600 feet, 250 foot today. Taxis, Hue to Phu Bai, 800 piastres, East Da Nang to the press centre, 500 piastres. Da Nang, Monday, 26 February, 0900, leave press centre, wait at airport till 1300, 13.30, take off. Tanson Nut Airport by 1600, City by 1700. Evening, wrote and recorded ABC taped voice piece with actuality sound on, quote, ethics of war. Shot listed, bracket, very comprehensive, all way footage. Labelled all film, expenses, one night Darnang Press Centre, 300 piastres. Taxis, military airport to the city, 1,000 piastres. On Wednesday, 21 February, Davis noted in his diary, shot and filmed the man with the white flag. <clears throat> he was with the American Marines on the southern bank of the Perfumed River. The North Vietnamese had complete control of the northern bank, which included the old stone citadel of the Imperial Palace. The opposite bank was under very heavy bombing and shelling by air and artillery. The Marines were right down on the bank of the river, which was about 100 metres wide at that point. In the midst of the action, a young man a civilian wearing black pants and a white shirt, came down to the opposite bank. He was one of the Vietnamese civilians trapped by the fighting. He waved his arms, obviously wanting to swim over to the American side. There was a brief pause and the Americans opened fire on him. He ran into a little shed like a boathouse and the Americans continued to pour a lot of fire into it. How the man wasn't killed then, I don't know. When the firing died down two or three minutes later, he ran out waving his white shirt like a flag. His intentions were perfectly obvious. He was a civilian, a refugee. After waving his shirt for two or three seconds, he didn't know what to do and started to run. Davis had his camera and tape recorder rolling. Here is the transcript of the sound tape from that point onwards. Bracket. Man runs out of the boathouse waving his white shirt. Close bracket. Hey, there. He's waving a white flag, bracket, sergeant's voice. Bullshit, cut him down, cut him down, bracket, heavy gunfire. Quote, cut him down, bracket, very heavy gunfire for about 30 seconds. Quote, can't see him anymore, bracket, a pause. Quote, cocksucker waved a white flag and then ran right for us. Oh, he waved a white flag and then ran for it. Davis said, he disintegrated right in front of my eyes. He believed the incident was essentially racist, that if the man had been a Caucasian, a Frenchman, 
the Marines would have welcomed him across. But I can't in my heart blame the Marines. It was their indoctrination, their commanders, and ultimately their government who sent them into that situation without knowing why they were there and who they were fighting with and against. Davis was not surprised some months later when the story of Lieutenant Kelly, or Lieutenant Kelly, and the My Lai Massacre came to light. There were other instances of torture by the Americans, and I filmed two or three of these. That is not to say the Viet South Vietnamese did not do it. They did, and for a purpose, to get information. So did the North Vietnamese. But I found it sad that the Americans mostly did it because they wanted to be cruel to the people concerned, their defeated enemy. The South Vietnamese never did that to their enemies. They might be brutal and torture a prisoner initially to get intelligence, but when that was over, they treated him with great compassion. There is a difference, I think. The sound tape Davis had recorded was more damning evidence than the film, which, for reasons never entirely explained, was not shown. At the time it wasn't. I've seen it on TV since 1990s. He passed on transcripts to several American correspondents who wrote the story. The consequences were serious. The American military then hounded me for the next 12 months, first to get back the tape, then to have me expelled from the country. But the South Vietnamese weren't going to have any of that. Their view of the argument was quite the opposite. The Americans did momentarily take away my military accreditation, which only meant I couldn't cover the Americans. I couldn't travel on their very comprehensive transport system. But it didn't worry me too much because I covered the Vietnamese side of the war mostly. Eventually I was let off the hook because Lieutenant Kelly's My Lai massacre came to light and the fact of shooting down one man with a white flag was lost. It became relatively unimportant. After the citadel fell and the devastated city of Hue was retaken, camera crews and journalists came in droves from Saigon. Pat Burgess was still in Hue with the Australian advisor, Warrant Officer Terry Egan. One of the cameramen, secure in the knowledge that the action was over, began filming the dead bodies of the North Vietnamese who had been lying in the cold, wet streets for several weeks. He began taking close-up shots of the face of one dead communist. The soldier had obviously died in agony, mouth open, teeth showing, and Egan, as a soldier, was outraged by this violation. Watch my flank, he said to Burgess, meaning the rest of the television crew. It was a big outfit, and there were about ten of them. The Australian warrant officer walked up behind the cameraman as he crouched over the dead soldier and booted him in the ass so hard that he fell over on top of his camera. Don't do that, said Egan. Me or my mate, indicating Burgess, could have looked like that three weeks ago. That's the point. It was during the 1968 Tet Offensive that one of the Vietnam War's coldest and most horrific images was photographed and filmed. The shooting of a Viet Cong suspect in the head by General Lo An, Saigon's chief of police. Even now, the watcher is fascinated and wants the action to stop, recoils and is revolted. Eddie Adams of Associated Press took the still picture and Vo Huyn, a South Vietnamese cine cameraman working for NBC, shot the news footage. Neil Davis did not excuse this killing of an unarmed man, even though it was common. There was a reason from General Lo An's point of view. Only an hour before he learned that the Viet Cong had swept over the police compound in Saigon, and his best friend, the police colonel, and his wife and six children were murdered. The children had their throats cut. Lo An was a godfather to some of them. When the Viet Cong suspect was brought before Lo An in the street, he asked where he had been captured, and it was near the police compound. What went through Luann's mind, one can only imagine, but he immediately took out his pistol and shot him. He never really recovered politically from that incident, but his attitude to the press didn't change much. He understood the press pretty well. Some days after the celebrated street execution, Luann fl flew to Hawaii while the battle for the Citadel was on. One of the first people he saw as he stepped out of his helicopter was Davis. He lifted his arm to which he had strapped a machine pistol, pointed it at me and said, Some day I kill you. Well, he didn't really mean that. I knew what he meant. It was another way of saying that there had been too much publicity, too many pictures. He certainly wasn't going to kill me, but it rather startled a British television crew who were standing right behind me filming. 
They thought they were going to have yet another execution on their hands. Loanne himself was badly shot up in an action in Saigon later that year. Pat Burgess helped to carry him from the scene. He liked Loanne and had been invited to his house. The general spoke fluent French and played the piano. There was a red rose beside him as he performed, Burgess recalls. It was just after the street execution and his wife gave him the rounds of the kitchen when it was published in the papers. Loanne said in French, well, what do you expect me to do? Go back to shooting them in the basement? His wife pointed out that he had sergeants for that sort of work. Ain't that a great marriage in a wonderful work environment? Home life balance, eh? Work life balance? The Communists' 1968 Tet Offensive was the biggest victory the South Vietnamese and Americans ever had in South Vietnam. Neil Davis saw the irony of public misconception reversing battle reality. The Viet Cong committed most of their troops to that offensive. They controlled most of Saigon for several days and captured some other cities, but at enormous cost. The agents who had been there all the time had to surface and were identified. After the towns and cities were recaptured, they had to flee. The Allies were in the best position they'd ever been in, but paradoxically the anti-war movement in America gained great momentum because of what appeared to be an Allied defeat. Most of the lost territory was regained by the South Vietnamese. That wasn't factually presented on most of the world's television sets. Most people believed that the Americans were doing most of the fighting. They did do a lot of fighting, but it was the South Vietnamese who physically recaptured most of the towns and cities in South Vietnam, much to the surprise of the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong. Until the start of 1968, the Allies were allegedly winning the war, and the media believed that. It was the Tet Offensive that shocked them into the realisation that it wasn't so. The media at that time did a complete turnaround. They presented the attack on the American embassy as a moral defeat. I think they were right in that, but wrong in presenting the whole offensive as a military defeat. One immediate result was that the southern-born guerrillas, the Viet Cong, were effectively destroyed. After that, it became a war with the North Vietnamese versus South Vietnam and America. In the final pages of his 1968 work diary, Davis noted the text of a letter recovered from a wounded North Vietnamese soldier during the Battle for Hue on 25 February 1968. It was written in North Vietnam on the 30th of September 1967. Dear Brother Thu, Today the weather is cool. I take the pen to write some sentences to you. Brother, you are just 16 years only, but forced by the wild dog army to leave. Other people are staying home and enjoying life, whereas you have to be in another land. Brother, as you live in the jungle, you hear neither birds sing nor cocks crow, but you see only the breeze and water current in the streams and see nobody at all. We are born and raised by our parents. I never forget you. The war is not over yet, but it seems that if you enjoy the war, you live. Brother, the night is long and the moon is light. I think life is, a, is pearl and gold. I wish you more successes in your career. I assume the chores at home. If you receive this letter, please answer me, your younger brother. Dang Van. And that's chapter 13, the Tet Offensive, the one I vividly remember watching on the television the fight at the uh, American embassy in Saigon, the ongoing, for weeks, battles all over Vietnam. And yeah, the chief of police shooting that fella and the battles for Hue. And then at the end of it, that was when some American officer made the world infamous statement we had to destroy Huey in order to save Huey. Which pretty much sums up the Vietnam War. Warbles on a lot to YouTube. Ciao.